This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another 2020 Fall EcoFoci seminar series. I am Heather Tavasola. I'm co-lead of the seminar with Jens Nielsen. And this seminar is part of NOAA's EcoFoci biannual seminar series focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and U.S. Arctic to improve understanding of ecosystem dynamics and applications for the management of living marine resources. Since October 21st, 1986, the seminar has provided an opportunity for research scientists and practitioners to present and develop their ideas and provoke conversations on subjects pertaining to fisheries, oceanography, or regional issues in Alaska's marine ecosystems. This is including the U.S. Arctic. And you can visit our ECOFOSI webpage for more information at www.ecofoci.noaa.gov. We thank you again for joining us today as we continue this all virtual seminar series. Uh, you can find the lineup uh, via the One NOAA seminar series and also on the NOAA PML calendar of events. We are here every Wednesday at 10 a.m. through December 16th, unless noted, next week being the second of our Monday series. Please double check that your microphones are muted, that you are not using video. Hi, Susan. If you could turn off your video, that'd be great. During the talk, please feel to type your questions into the chat. Jens will be monitoring the questions there, as will I, and we'll address those at the end of the talk. Each, um, let's see. So today, I am really excited. We have Jennifer Provencher, a conservation biologist at the Environment and Climate Change Canada in Ottawa, Canada. She is an um, early career researcher and spokesperson for the awareness of plastic contaminants in marine life, pollution, and climate change. Men much of her work focuses on the impact of human activities on the health of Arctic seabirds and marine ecosystems. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Marine Biology and her Bachelor's of Education in Senior Sciences in Biology from the University of British Columbia and has received her Master's of Science from the University of Victoria for her work on seabirds as indicators of change in the Eastern Canadian And her PhD in Biology for Environmental and Chemical Tox Toxicology um, is at Carleton University and focused on parasites and mercury as possible drivers of avian health and reproduction. And with that, I'm going to turn the seminar over to Jennifer, who is sharing her work today in old threat, increasing fisheries and seabird bycatch in the Canadian and examining the implications of growing fisheries there on northern fulmar populations using a variety of modeling, observation, and genomic tools. So Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you. I'm going to mute myself and begin. Awesome. Thank you, Heather, for that introduction. And thank you all for taking the time to join today. I know this is a, a little different, perhaps, in terms of geography, but I hope that my talk on, on seabird bycatch in the Arctic fishery in Canada will uh, kind of inspire or, or think about uh, some of the some of the work that, you, uh, you know, is applicable to your region. So first of all, I just want to, this is my title slide, and I just want to recognize that the work that I, I do specifically on, on bycatch, but also on plastic pollution is, is on the traditional territory of the Inuit. So it's on Inuit Nunagat, the homeland of the Inuit. And you'll see that my title is translated into Anuktitut. So this is one of the dialects. Uh, the, um, one of the main dialects in Canada of the Inuit, uh, and you can see the syllabic. So it's a uh, it's a really interesting um, language and it has a beautiful history. And uh, but I just wanted to note that traditional territory, and also you know we we do do a lot of community based work, and we we translate uh, a lot of our summaries and work into into a So I just want to kind of recognize and and think about that as we move through this this work. Uh, and this is work that we have done in collaboration. It was part of my postdoc um, that I started and then got hired with in Environment and Climate Change Canada. So it's work that we're continuing to work on with industry as we kind of learn more about what's happening in this fishery. So really quickly, for those of you who don't know Northern Fulmars, this is a circumarctic species. There are a seabird in the north, 
breeding in the north that is most related to uh, albatross that some of you may know if you're not familiar directly with the fulmar. In Canada, they're specifically uh, have challenges from plastic pollution. The center image is actually all the pieces of plastic taken from one fulmar stomach. We have natural oil and gas seeps in the region. So I have a, another program that looks at the effects of these natural oil and gas seeps. Uh, and so you can, this is actually a picture of a fulmar taken from a boat uh, by a colleague of mine and they're you know, basically swimming and feeding through some of these natural oil slicks. And then uh, probably potentially more familiar to some of you is uh, the entanglement threat. So this is actually a picture of a fulmar that's become entangled by a piece of fishing line that uh, you know, probably got brought back to the colony and then entangled. So these are all things that are happening kind of on the colony and at sea. Um, and then, of course, kind of in a more active way, the plastic uh, and the fisheries and the entanglement in in these birds. And so this is actually a picture of a fulmar caught from one of the boats. And the picture on the right is actually a colleague's picture from a duck, but it's the same kind of thing. They're they're getting tangled, and I'll talk more about this, but in gill nets. You can see that the the nets are almost transparent, and the birds are actually getting tangled right in, in them, so uh, just like this duck is on the right. Uh, I do want to kind of in uh, kind of pause and think about seabird and fisheries interactions, and, and certainly there are probably people on this call who have thought a lot more about these types of interactions, but this is something that we're, we're thinking about actively on this file. There are certainly those direct, uh, you know, bycatch challenges, seabirds in general, um, and Fulmar is specifically what we'll talk about, but discards also come into play and then direct competition. And so we're going to really focus on the bycatch today, but I want you to kind of tuck that into the back of your, back of your head. A lot of the work that we're working on uh, really stems from work that people have been doing for a long time on seabird bycatch. BirdLife International has done a lot of work kind of summarizing and, and understanding bycatch in fisheries. They have done estimates on, you know, number of birds per year in longline fisheries, gillnet fisheries, and of course trawl fisheries. And this has been kind of growing over time and as we get more detail in different regions, uh, Zydelis did a review of this a little while ago, specifically around gill nets. There's, you know, there's, as again, many of you probably know, there's a lot more work on the bycatch in long lines, but there is less work on the gill net side. And so it has an estimated about 400,000 birds per year are affected, but there's a lot of question marks around what that looks like in what different areas, and, and specifically in the Canadian Arctic, unlike uh, the, the Northeast Pacific, we have a lot of uh, new fisheries, growing fisheries. Uh, we don't have as many established fisheries, so this is really a uh, a new area for us to be addressing in this particular geography. So the first glimpse of data from fisheries in the Canadian Arctic actually came from a paper just in 2015. This is done by April Head, who's also with en Environment and Climate Change Canada, and she looked at uh, seabird bycatch in eastern Canada, so that's the Atlantic region, as well as the Arctic, so that piece of water between Canada and Greenland. And this is really the first time that it was looked at. And what she found was that although there was a few number of boats in the Canadian Arctic, their, their catch uh, kind of per effort as best as she could assess it was actually quite high. And so, and very specifically, it was, it was Greenland halibut or turbot, specifically in these demersal gill nets that are, are weighted and baited at the bottom of the, of the, um, sort of the ocean, and that they were having these really high, high levels of bycatch, specifically of fulmars. And so under the Arctic Council, and for those of you who don't know the Arctic Council, it is the kind of working um, group of the eight Arctic nations, of course, which Canada and US are both members of. And, and through this work under CAF, which is the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, and, and specifically under the Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative, seabird bycatch was included. And uh, interestingly, both, uh, well, the, the, the Canada kind of initiated Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative and as a really big pusher of this, of this program. And it was actually under the American chairmanship of CAF, which we had the second work plan approved with bycatch included. And so this has been 
on the Arctic radar for the last little bit, but there has been huge amount of kind of cooperation and work under under the Arctic Council and specifically CAF on this subject. And so that's one of the reasons why we've been able to push this work ahead in the last couple of years is really because of this uh, international collaboration in the Arctic, looking at drivers of, of, of bird populations and specifically seabird populations with fisheries as a highlight. So just as a, a kind of a brief uh, intro to this region, so we've got the NAFO regions uh, in, in Eastern Canada. We're talking about 0A, 0B. So these are these blue regions up here, uh, Baffin Bay, Davis Strait. And they are all, they go all the way out to the EZ, their EEZ with uh, Greenland, Kingdom of Denmark. Um, and so this is what we're referring to as kind of the Eastern Canadian Arctic in this particular talk. These you know, two all the way through to five, which I often refer to as the alphabet soup. This is what we refer to in Canada as the Atlantic region, whereas we have zero A, zero B is our Arctic region. So ours, there is commercial fishing in the region. It, it's growing every couple of years. They um, increase the quota. Uh, it's, it's uh, as I mentioned, it's part of Inuit Nunatgat. So it's, it's part of the Inuit settlement region. And uh, this is, you know, introduces a co-management framework. So it's, it's the, there's a, a federal government, there's a territorial government, as well as an Indian government involved. In this particular region, it uses mostly trawl and demersal set nets, um, and the gill nets in particular are baited. Uh, and this, so this is kind of information that we've kind of um, come, kind of, kind of, sorry, it's, kind of emerged over time. So, you know, how it's baited, how frequently it's baited, what it's baited with, is not necessarily something that's tracked over time, but has emerged in our conversations with fisher, fishermen uh, specifically. And just to give you an idea of kind of the region and the, and the traffic, we also have uh, the, the ship tracking data, and this is from other uh, environment and climate change data. So we actually have the ship tracks from the fishing boat. So, this is actually just a heat map. It's just the fishing vessels. Uh, and you can see that these Canadian fishing grounds off the coast of Baffin Island, these are clearly, uh, you know, where they're fishing, this, these are shelf breaks. And you can see most of them actually offload in, into Greenland. Um, and then the more southern boats off the coast of Newfoundland go down to Newfoundland to offload. So these are large vessels that are out for months at a time. They travel to Greenland, offload, and then come back into Canada. So it is a kind of a, a complex uh, international system that we're dealing with in terms of fish and birds and in the, in the fisheries. Uh, one of the first things that we tried to do is really just figure out um, how this fishery has changed over time. And this is just a really simple graph of the total allowable catch, which is, which is fulfilled almost each and every year, and it's in tons per year. And so we've got a two NAFA regions, 0A, 0B, and you can see 0A, which is the more northern region, the fishery, commercial fishery didn't start until 2002 and has grown every year since. And so we are seeing an increase in this fishery and this again continues to grow. And so that left uh, ECCC, who has our, you know, the, the migratory bird uh, mandate to understand really what are the species affected, how many are taken per year, and, and ultimately does it actually matter at the population level, which is a question that we're constantly trying to balance as we do have, you know, um, take of migratory bird and harvest in other ways. So we are managing it within a very dynamic system. So we did some overlap analysis with Bird Studies Canada, and, and we started by looking at where the seabird colonies are and where the fisheries are, and this is just an example where we have thick-billed murres who are, are an alcid uh, species. They're, they, these are the locations of the, of the colonies. The, the darker inner circle, the shaded circle, is 100 kilometers, which we think is a pretty average foraging range. And then the outer circle is 200 kilometers, and we think that this is kind of the maximum foraging daily range from these colonies. So you can see they're distributed throughout the region, and we kind of have these bubbles to see where they're overlapping fisheries. The, the other dots here at sea is where we actually have seabird bycatch reported in the, in the fisheries data. 
And so it was really just a really brief look at how do we have, think about our seabird distribution as overlapping with these fisheries. We see some overlap, but the MERS in particular are not boat attracted and they're deep set nets. And so we think that there's pretty minimal interactions. And that's really what comes out in the data. We don't see MERS in the data. Uh, on, 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 in contrary, these are the northern fulmars. So this is a um, fulmar. They're, they're tube noses. You can see again the blue dots are the distribution of their colonies. The gray circles are their average foraging distance. So it's 200 kilometers. Of course, it's, it's not actually on land. It's all at sea. Uh, and 500 kilometers is their maximum. So you can see their, their max bubbles are way out here and, and effectively cover the entire Baffin Bay Davis Strait region. And so we have high overlap with these fisheries as well as high vulnerability. They're, they're, they are tube noses and so they smell out, they smell out their food. And so this causes a problem to, to the fulmar in particular because they are boat attractive. So one of the first things that we did was look at the seabird bycatch data. So on these vessels, uh, depending on the fishery and the time of year, there are at sea observers. There's anywhere between 20 and 100% coverage. Of, of course, uh, you know, there's never 100% coverage, but that is the, the target. And when we start looking at the data from these at sea observers, and this is just one year of data, we see that northern fulmars are the majority of the data, almost three quarters. And then the next category is, you know, birds, gulls, phalarope. These are kind of our next topics. And then we have a few, a handful of these other species in here. And the most important part is, is that from a bird perspective, you know, 21% of the data is basically useless. That's, you know, we, we can't really use this in terms of species identification, uh, you know, modeling. This is very challenging data to work with. Uh, you know, I always laugh when we get bird entered back because um, that really doesn't help us at all. And so one of the challenges that we've been working with is, is how do we get this better? And so it might seem simple, um, but it's not. And I do want to recognize that it's very challenging in the bird world. So this is actually a bit of a test to see who's paying attention. And the idea is, is that we've got a whole bunch of different birds here. These are all birds that are reported in the region and specifically in seabird bycatch. And my question for you, and I want you to type it into the chat, is how many species do you see? So I'm gonna take a minute there. You can chat, you can try to Google it, but what we're looking for is how many species of seabirds do you see? And I want you to enter your number into the chat box. Don't be shy, I'm not judging. I see some threes, some fours, twos, some fours, twos, threes. Yeah, interesting. No one's got higher than a four. Any, anyone out there think there's more than four species here? I don't see anyone committing to more than a four. <laughs> okay, so revisions. So I, I put this in there to demonstrate that, you know, while we can complain about species identification, it's not straightforward. And specifically with these prothalariform, these petrol species, it's, it's not straightforward, even for seabird people. And so there's actually several species on here. So we have sooty shearwater in the top corner, core shearwater in the, in the right top corner, so the mink shearwater and a great shearwater <laughs> in the bottom left. And then the other three are northern fulmars, and they're different color morphs. And so the fulmar in particular is a challenging bird because they can have different color morphs. And so they can go from the very light, which is in the center bottom, to the quite dark, which is on the bottom right. And then there's a whole lot of inter, inter between. Uh, and so this really does demonstrate that it, it is a challenge even for, for seabird people and people who are familiar with these species. So one of the things that we've done is that we've been trying to target training of the at sea observers in a couple of different regions. And so we're, we're currently targeting it in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. And these are our regions where most of our at sea observers in the Arctic come from. Um, but what we have been doing actually with our um, kind of piggybacking on some of our Pacific colleagues work is developing these 
uh, Fulmar and Shearwater guides. And so this is an example of a, of a guide that's been developed specifically for fisheries where it's, it's queuing in on the indicators or the attributes that species will have and is visible to that observer when they have that bird in hand. And of course, they're, they're, the species are difficult to tell apart when they're you know, intact and, and not kind of half decomposed or wet. And so we're really trying to think about what are the attributes or characteristics that the birds have, even when they can you know, kind of come up scuzzy from the net. And so this is some of the work that we're trying to really focus on with our partners so that we can get better data to understand what those impacts are from the fisheries on our seabirds. The other thing that we've been doing is trying to get DFO, which is our, our Department of Fisheries and Oceans, to improve the data collected. So they had these um, you know, enhanced data sheets on marine mammals. And so we worked with them to get the same kind of data on our on the birds. And so we sent these out uh, a few years back and they entered all the data. And one of the questions we had was on a baited net question. And so it does come back, almost all the birds that we're seeing, all are from these baited nets. Um, and so that was a really important piece in terms of understanding why the birds are being attracted and what potential mitigation could be. Uh, and then we also try to get more data about the birds and whether they are dead or if they're just caught struck, um, caught or struck in the gear. And so we kind of, because in the, at the observer data, really it's only these dead birds that are brought ashore that are only ever counted. And we really wanted to understand if there was other um, interactions that were being, um, being done as well. And so, you know, from this initial data, what we're seeing is that, again, about 60% of the birds are dead. And, and this is the data that's reported in this, the At Sea Observer database. And then we have this kind of other 38% that are caught or struck, but then we don't know what happens to them. And, and actually a lot of work out of uh, partners in places like California have, you know, really, I think, illustrated that these birds are, are likely injured and, and probably, uh, you know, die later on. They're just not caught in the nets of time, but, you know, they can break wings uh, mostly and, and go on to die. So th we do really understand that the DFO data at the, um, at the observer is underestimating the interactions between seabirds and fisheries. And so it's really only about 60% of the data is coming through. We have gone back and taken that data and tried to look at how many filmers are taken each year. And this is uh, data that we did. And if you're interested in this, I, you know, I'm happy to unpack this a little bit more, but I know some people will be interested. So, you know, we went through, we looked at different time periods because of the different um, observer coverage. We looked at different gear types, the so long lines, gill nets and, and mobile or trawls. We also considered the level of fishing in Canada and Greenland and, and what kind of um, gear that they use. And, and, the, and we looked over several years to try to get you know, an average because there's high variability in the full marks that are reported each year. And the idea is that we came up with some average and then we, we did some regional demographic modeling to get this question of, does it matter at the population level? We then took, uh, you know, we use kind of where the fishing happens data and considered some of the tracking data that's been done on these species. And, and so just as an example, this is a bird that was um, tagged in Scotland and you can see it kind of goes all the way across the North Atlantic and all the way back. So looking at how far they go and again, using this tracking data, we came up with these three different scenarios that the fisheries could be affecting. So the blue hashes in this diagram are the fisheries. So again, zero a zero b and one our first demographic model was thinking about what if just the local colonies right in around the fisheries are being affected so these are mostly three canadian colonies you know the next scenario was okay what happens if it's more of a regional level so we've got canadian colonies and greenlandic colonies of northern fulmers and then the largest demographic model that we projected was what if all the colonies in canada and greenland are being affected by these northern fisheries. And we thought that these were, you know, realistic options to consider in this first, you know, first assessment. Uh, so re really local to kind of the entire region, which we know uh, has, po has populations in the area. This was work that uh, Christine Anderson led and, and, and we published it a few years ago. And again, we've got this small local population level, this intermediate, 
and then the 500,000 individuals. These are the FOMARs in Canada and Greenland. And you can see, if I can just kind of walk you through this for a second, we have our bycatch mortality on the, on the, on the bottom. This dotted line is that 212 uh, level, which we, we got from our SC observer data. And then we have our growth rate um, on the vertical. So if you're at a zero level here, which is the red bar across all of these, you would ex basically expect um, a stable population. Anywhere the black line crosses and is down here on the bottom, we're seeing population decline. And anything above here, we're going to be seeing population growth. And of course, on the line, it's going to be stable. And the real take home message here is that at the current level, so where the the dotted line crosses the solid black line, we're below zero. And so we're thinking that we're probably experiencing population decline. What's really interesting is I think if we're thinking about here, this, this larger regional level, which, which we might be at, it's not a huge jump. It's only a, a reduction of bycatch by about 25%. And we would actually be getting the fishery to having, you know, negligible impact on the fishery. So this is something that was encouraging to us that we, we think could be um, interesting to discuss. And then of course there is this larger population that could be affected. You know, we have, the, uh, sorry, we have fulmires nesting in Iceland and, and, and Europe who, who may be coming over and being caught in the nest, but we didn't really have the data to kind of think about it, but we're certainly aware that we could be actually affecting a larger population. So this kind of affected population size could really, you know, be any one of these, these levels. So we want to explore that. So that, you know, really points to, okay, well, what is the population size doing in Canada? And this is where a lot of my colleagues kind of laugh at me. So some of our data from the, this region actually dates back to 1974. Uh, and so it is, the, for some of us, the data is actually older than some of us are. And so it's really challenging. So, you know, this kind of gives you an example of the nesting habitat. So these are cliffs on Baffin Island. You can see the sea ice kind of along the bottom. And then these green areas, these are the photos from 1974. These green areas have been scanned in and then digitally gone through and kind of highlighted where the birds are. And so this is, you know, clearly needing updating. And I really point out that the last survey was 2001. And if you remember, the fisheries really started to take off in 2002. And so while it's great that we have this historic data that dates before the fisheries, we don't actually have much data since the fisheries. And this is a large problem. And so again, um, this is a lot of information, but just kind of so that you understand it, these are our colonies, we have our protected areas, we have co-management of these populations with uh, Inuit communities, and so these are the communities that we work with uh, to co-manage these, these colonies. And then we have our last year surveyed and our colony size. So you can see it's very, very variable in terms of when our, our data is from. And so the goal was, was to focus on these Baffin colonies. These are the colonies right beside the fishery um, and really update these values. And so we have the kind of, again, historic data, which is great, but we don't have any, we don't, we did not have any contemporary data. So in 2018, we launched, I would say, a fairly sizable program with three communities, Clyde River Pond Inlet and Kikatar Joac. And you can see this is our, our collaborative uh, researcher, northern community member team out on the land. And you can actually see this is the colony in the background uh, where the birds, birds nest. And so we were able in 2018 to go out and actually assess, re-census the colony. And so this led to a paper we published this, this past year. And the take home message is, is we were able to go to all three of these colonies with a a certain degree of confidence that we are able to publish new numbers at. We see declines at all the colonies visited in 2018. Uh, we, we did drones to do some of the colony surveys, and this was actually very useful to better assess the tops of the cliff, which is pr previously almost impossible. And interestingly, although the historic data is not great uh, at most of them, or even any of them, we do see that it looks like a, you know, between one to three percent decline of the colonies over um, each year over that time period. And so, uh, you know, again, while this data is not perfect, uh, it is consistent along the colonies um, and really did show, uh, you know, a decline. And so this was, uh, you know, further evidence that we needed to understand the fisheries a little bit better. 
So, you know, we updated these source population sizes. So we've got these new numbers. It was really exciting to update these in our database. We weren't able to get to all of them. This is a really hard colony uh, as demonstrated. We haven't been able to get there since 1973, but uh, it remains elusive to get to. So we're hoping to get back to this one. Um, but we have these other regions um, outside of the Baffin region. These are the ones now in, in the red and of course, um, we we did plan to go to all of these, and we had the funding and logistics in place uh, to go to these other colonies in 2020. And unfortunately, because of, of COVID, of course, travel is is not permitted at this time. And so we are hoping to go to 2021. We are currently in the process of you know finding and replacing 2020 to 2021 and all of our our permits and applications. And we have every reason to believe that if travel is permitted, even regionally within the territory of Nunavut, that these permits will get underway. Um, and so we're hoping to get back to these colonies to do more work. So to kind of go on to you know, the next question is, you know, one of the reasons, or sorry, one of the other pieces of information that we could get in is actually partnering with uh, Queen's University and Vicki Friesen, who is a geneticist and specializes on seabirds. And so we've been exploring how genetic assignment to these colonies and populations could be useful in this particular project. And again, understanding which of these colonies are affected. You know, we've got that small, medium, and very large potential source population. And we thought that maybe genetics could help us uh, understand, again, what the source population is for these fisheries. And so over the last couple of years, we actually worked with the uh, fishing boats, the quota holders. We prepped these, these coolers with the permits and data sheets uh, and, and kind of asked and, and trained that staff on the boats to do collections of the fulmars. So rather than you know, putting the fulmars overboard, putting them into the cooler and shipping them to us, uh, it was really exciting. I love getting emails from the fishermen, you know, showing me the coolers on the boats, which is always great. And this is specifically from the Nunavut Fisheries Association. And so they're partners in this work and have been very, very supportive. We got ended up getting three coolers from two boats, uh, all the fulmars, a total of 19 birds. And so we've used these birds to actually look at some of the genetic um, kind of variation among populations. And so this is work that Lily Coulson Nepali did for her master's at Queen's University with Vicky. And I'm going to walk you through this one a little bit. I'm, I'm not a geneticist. I'm not a genetics expert. So bear with me if you are. But the, the idea is, is that this is a, a PCA analysis of three known colonies. So Arctic Canada, all of these samples are from, from the colony. So we know that these birds were born on Arctic Canada colony. So they kind of cluster together. The Faroe Islands is this green cluster. So again, we know that this, we know their source colony, their source um, population. And then Bjornia is in Norway. And so we know that these birds, again, fall out genetically, slightly different. So you can differentiate them a little bit. And so what we did, and what Lily did, was then apply. So we have Labrador seabirds. These are birds that were collected off of, off of Newfoundland um, by hunters. And then we have our Baffin Bay bycatch. So these are two types of bird collections that took place at sea. So we don't know where they came from, but we know they were caught in Canadian waters in two different regions, Labrador Sea and Baffin Bay. And what we see is that the Labrador birds map onto, it's a real mix between the Faroe Island birds, birds that were born in the Faroes, and birds that were born in the Canadian Arctic. And then the Baffin Bay bycatch birds almost map right on to the Arctic Canadian born birds. And so it does seem like the Labrador seabirds, again, are mostly this European or Faroese source, whereas the bycatch birds in the Arctic are most likely those Arctic breeders. And just to kind of break this down, again, this is a lot of, of information, but I just want to recognize all of these different tests that Lily did. So Lily ran these tests in a couple of different ways. Um, tried to break it down in a couple of different ways. And really the take home messages in these Labrador seabirds, birds that were caught in Newfoundland waters, it's a real mix of Arctic birds and European birds. And kind of it doesn't matter kind of what test you apply, all these different ones really point to the fact that it's, it's a mixed population between North American populations and European populations in 
the Newfoundland waters. Um, and so that really points that we have to figure out how do we include these Arctic Canada birds when we're doing def demographic modeling, because certainly mortality of Arctic Canada birds is not just taking place in Arctic Canada. And then the other real take home message is that the bycatch from the northern fisheries does appear to be all Canadian Arctic breeders. And so again, she's done a couple of different tests. And if you're interested in, I can point you to the paper where Lily details all of this. But the, again, the point is that the bycatch birds do seem to be all of these larger colonies. And there is a mix of colonies from the north and the south. So they're not just talking local colonies, we're talking about all the colonies in Canada. And so if we go back to our demographic modeling, now based on Lily's information and Lily's studies, we can kind of rule out this idea that there are these two smaller versions. And it's unlikely that the bycatch birds are going to be in this larger model where we have European birds, but we do think that it's really sitting nicely in this um, kind of regional, regional population, so about 500 individuals. So this has been really helpful in terms of using genetics to kind of get at what level of sort of population we're looking at. So just a little bit about kind of where do we go from here? Um, and so again, we're partnered with the New York Fisheries Association. So um, you know, EC under my program has been trying to do all these things for the last couple of years. So Reserve and Colonies is under work. We're continuing to do demographic modeling, carcass collection, and increased training. So these are all things that we are, you know, have done or continuing to do. And then the Nunavut Fisheries Association has actually supported a MyTax grant. And, and MyTax, I'm not sure if you guys have MyTax in the US, but MyTax is a, it's a program in Canada where you can do industry supported work. And so they have supported a PhD student who uh, is at the University of New Brunswick. Her name's Allison Anhold and she's with Heather Major. And so she'll be actually doing some of this other work. So Fisher Knowledge Survey to understand really where the fishery bird interaction is happening. We want to, again, understand the take of the bycatch, sorry, take of fulmars along the entire flyway, so beyond 0A0B. There's some discussions about vulnerability mapping, and, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of environmental, you know, kind of other data beyond just the bird and the net that we haven't really explored. So we're hoping that Allison can really dig into some of these things uh, throughout her PhD. Uh, again, I think what's really interesting and, and, and not specific to Canada, but very present in, in Nunavut is that it is uh, a co-management system. Um, Nunavut is, is, a, is a territory and has an ecosystem-based management framework. They are you know, developing their Nunavut fishery strategy. They're promoting fisheries in the region. Um, and so we do have these co-management boards that frankly, are one of the few groups that have a, a management mandate over seabirds and fisheries. And so uh, I think similar to the U.S., you know, our DFO does fisheries, Environment Canada does seabirds, but it's a co-management. It's, it's unique in Canada um, that the, the it's the co-management boards that actually have a mandate for both seabirds and fisheries. So it's been really interesting to work with this with this program. And then, of course, the marine stewardship certification is ongoing uh, because there, this is very much being promoted under the Nunavut fishery strategy. And just a really kind of quick mention of that um, certification, the fishery uh, in 0AB, as well as a, a few other regions for Greenland halibut has gone for certification. There's a little bit of a timeline there, but uh, again, if anyone wants to talk details, I'm happy to do so. But I really want to draw your attention to um, in October 2019, so just a year ago, uh, we actually got confirmation that really uh, northern fulmars are specifically named in the um, in 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 the certification and the review. And so that really holds, you know, all of us, I would say, Department of Fisheries, Environment Canada, as well as the fisheries industry to doing more work in this over time and really assessing what those, um, you know, biologically based limits are to ensure that the recovery of the species is not hindered. And so that was, I think, a real collaborative win that it's, it is included and will continue to work on this. We do want to come back to this idea of fisheries and seabird interactions. And so one of the things that we've gotten through talking with fishers in the region is that the bycatch is happening because the discard is happening. And so different boats actually use different kind of processing and, um, you know, discard 
I don't want to say protocol, but just kind of mechanisms. And so one of the things that we really want to explore specifically through the Fisher surveys is how do we, how, how are these interactions actually happening? And so we think that by really tackling discards and bycatch together, we can actually, you know, by, through reducing discards, we can actually reduce bycatch. So this is work that Allison will really be following up on. I want to kind of touch on two other kind of bycatch bur, sorry, bycatch questions that we've been talking about specifically in the Arctic. Um, we did a joint project again with the Arctic Council on lumpsucker fisheries. And so this has been interesting um, to try to get the data from. We had to get data from, I, I believe it was four or five countries. It was a real challenge. It's a small fishery, um, but potentially has high impacts on birds. In, in uh, Signe Christensen Dalka published this. Um, last year, and it's a really interesting example of how do you bring bycatch data together from across a single fishery, but you do it at the scale of all all of the all the fisheries and look at the fishery wide impact and, and specifically on birds for this case. And so this has been an interesting you know way we often think about doing it as a, from the perspective of the bird, but this is a really international way to look at fisheries and and think about how this might be affecting seabirds. What's really interesting is that through this project, we've looked at, this is actually the um, number of participants in the lumpsucker fishery over time in Canada. Uh, again, these four Napa regions, and you see it's really decreased over time. And so, although this fishery was identified specifically in Iceland as a huge problem for seabirds, we actually think that this is a past problem for seabirds in Canada. And so this fishery just doesn't really exist anymore. So, while we're super happy to contribute to this, you know, we don't we don't actually see this as an emerging fishery. This is a very small fishery in Canada. On the flip side of that, we also have a lot of Arctic char fisheries in Canada. And this is a project I work on uh, with with CFO and, and colleagues at Acadia University and University of Toronto. This is Bonnie Hamilton, who is a PhD student that I work with, and we're specifically looking at plastics and plastic pollution in fish. Um, but through this work, we, you know, we work collective or collaboratively with the Cambridge Bay. So this is where Cambridge Bay is in the central Canadian Arctic. Um, and we've started to really dive into some of the seabird bycatch of these small scale subsistence commercial gillnet fisheries. And so again, this is a little snapshot of the data that we've looked at over time. And this is kind of in, this is in prep. I'm hoping that we'll have a first draft of it to, you know, to look at in the next month or so, but we see this as a growing problem for seabirds. And I think this is, um, you know, something that is really interesting to think about it as we have, you know, changing fisheries practices in, in worldwide, but specifically in, in the Arctic. Uh, and we have some of these, some of these fisheries going again for these, these different uh, assessments, Seaford Watch and Ocean Wise are the ones that we kind of think about. Um, they often publish those certifications based on published data, but when there's no data, um, they have nothing to rank on. And so we, we're trying to um, really think strategically about how do we get some of those data published so that it is being understood by fishers and certifications so that we can start to collectively nudge towards solutions. And so we're, we're working on this collectively to try, again, try to influence and, and think about this in different ways. So I'm going to pause or stop there and, and thanks everyone for listening and hopefully I can take a question or two. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'm going to give a clap round of applause like I do for everybody, every second <laughs> on that call. Um, and I think we're um, focused. I know we've been going with video, but it sounds like Jen's connection um, discourages her from uh, doing video. So um, unless you want to try it, Jen, I don't want you to get bumped off. But um, I will stay off video as well because I don't want to ruin that connection. See if what happens. I'll try. Okay. So <laughs> there's Jennifer, everybody. <laughs> um, and if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I always love observer questions as an ex observer myself who did marine mammals and seabirds. That was fun, a fun challenge. <laughs> Any questions? Jens, do you see any questions in the chat? No, so I actually I... have one from... Go ahead. Sorry, Jens, go ahead. 
I was going to ask a question, but feel free to go for it. No, I'll take your question, and then I actually see there's one in the chat to me, but I'll I'll talk to the group. So why don't you go first? Yeah, I was just curious when you showed this, um, <clears throat> your colonies and how they, you know, you've not a lot of sampling in the past. It got me wondering about how much does the colony sizes sort of vary between warm and cold years? Are they pretty consistent, or does it change? And I guess sort of in relation to that, do you suspect that sort of colonies are shifting northward as with warming climate, if that makes sense? Yeah, those are great questions. I So in the Canadian Arctic, I think probably similar to the US Arctic, those colonies are really hard to get to. Um, in North America, and you know, inclusive of Greenland, all of those former colonies are, are quite far north. And so we rely specifically on a lot of our demographic modeling data and that type of data in terms of like colony attendance and warm years and cold years, we rely on our European colleagues. So to get to, to get to, uh, you know, North American colleagues, you know, I, there's like multiple planes involved, sometimes a snowmobile involved. Like it's, you know, in Iceland, you just drive to the colony. Like I was on a, a bus tour um, for the, you know, um, a, uh, um, a, like an Arctic duck symposium that took place in Iceland. And we just got on a bus and like drove to a Northern Fulmar colony. And so we rely on a lot of, I would say European Fulmar demographics. And as far as I know, they, there's, you know, relatively high site fidelity. There does not seem to be a connection kind of between warm years and cold years. And we don't see uh, a northern movement in this species, at least yet. Um, that's not true of all birds. It seems, I think the ox, um, uh, certainly we see other species, razor bills and things moving into the Canadian Arctic, but we don't see northern fulmar shifting. So the Canadian Arctic would be the, a horrible place to address those questions because it's so big and under monitored. So again, we rely on some of our European colleagues to fill in a lot of those demographic questions for us because their colonies are super accessible uh, compared to ours. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Uh, let's see, Colleen Harpel said, thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, Ash Adams has asked, um, do you offer internships or research assistant positions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, normally we do. So I often, I have students and I have co-op students. One of the real challenges right now is, of course, um, um, travel. Most, I have to admit, most people want to work with me because they want to go to the Arctic. Um, and that is basically impossible right now. We have a travel ban on, and so we're not taking any students on um, that basically require travel to the north. I don't, I don't know if any of you kind of are aware of the COVID landscape in Canada, but up until two weeks ago, the territory of Nunavut was actually COVID free. Uh, and so they've had travel restrictions on since March and, and have just gone into lockdown. So we're projecting not going to the Canadian Arctic, Nunavut, for at least probably a year um, or until there's a globally available vaccine that can be widely distributed. So, yeah, it's a tricky one. So the answer is yes, but it's, it's, it's hard right now. Um, yeah, yeah, and then Tom is good. Actually, just gave a question. I can. So hit, the question was, any work being done to mitigate northern fulmar bycatch at the source? So yeah, it's a that's a really good question, and that's a really complex question that we're hoping Allison can dive into. So what we think is happening is that uh, the boats that are taking Greenland halibut in, some of them have this. Again, I'm not a fisheries person, so don't laugh at me too hard. But they have, you know, they have a machine that the 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 fish come in and they get sliced and all the guts get sucked out and it's kind of held in this vacuum tank, this holding tank, because the sucking happens under vacuum. And so when the, they're hauling and taking fish in, there this this machine is happening. But because of the mechanism, it's a vacuum. But by virtue of that, they have a holding tank. And so they don't haul and discard at the same time because that's how this machine works. But other boats have, have machines that can, can, can haul and take the halibut in and get the halibut and then discard continuously as they're hauling. And so there is some suggestion through talking with partners that 
just the simple difference between the, I hate to say it, but like the gut, I don't know what the proper word is, the gutting machine, the machine that guts the fish, having a holding tank versus not having a holding tank could mean the difference basically between having bycatch and almost having no bycatch. Because in the data we see it is really episodic. So the bird, the, the boats, or not even the boats, but the times that we, they get fulmars, they get a lot of fulmars. And then there's a whole bunch without it. Um, and so that's kind of our, our discussion point right now, and we're trying to get through it surveys. So the challenging part is that of this system is that we know bycatch is happening, we know the species, we know the fisheries, we know the gear type, but we, we don't know how and when. We just know that the birds end up dead in the net, but we don't know more about that. And so part of Allison's work will be talking with the fishers to, to explore that more, what are their observations, because if it's simple as recommending you know, a non-discard machine, or maybe it's some kind of form of Tory lines as they're kind of hauling. You know, those mitigations are actually pretty simple, but we don't know what to recommend yet because we actually don't know what the interaction is. That's such a good question um, and a really hard topic to address, right? Um, on those lines, uh, Diana, I see your question. I'm gonna answer, ask Melanie's first. Melanie, um, Melanie Paquin asked, can the net filaments uh, can you change the color of those to help as an avoidance measure? Yeah, and that's a really great question. So the challenge of this fishery is, as most gillnet fisheries, we think of as a problem. So in in in, in more southern Canada, eastern Canada, we, you know, they put the gillnets out, and then there's been a lot of research on, yeah, changing the gillnet color or putting flashers on them, or um, there's ones with acoustic deterrent. And so you're altering the, the, the gill net because the birds, you know, they're putting the gill net out and then the birds are caught in it and then they're coming back and they're bringing the nets in and the birds are in the net. Again, these are demersal gill nets, so they're hundreds of feet down. And so the problem is, is that it's, so from all our conversations with fishers, the nets get set without bird incident. The nets are weighted and baited for the, the fish to be attracted to them. And they're hundreds and hundreds of feet down. So they're, they're way down at the bottom. But the problem is, and we think the indirection is, is when they pull the nets back up, you've got baited nets, you've got fish in the nets. Uh, and because the, the fulmars are, are tube noses, they're attracted to the smell of fish at the surface. And so they're flying in. And so this is why we think either Tory lines or that discard connection is really the problem um, because it's not a visual cue, it's an olfactory cue, and it's, it's, it's happening at the surface on that hauling stage. It's not kind of when they're, it's, it's not, most gill net problems, the interaction is happening when they're set, whereas this problem is happening on when they're hauling the net. And so this is the other interesting part is that, uh, and I think this is really interesting to talk about because just because you have a gill net problem, the solution is not going to be universal. The solution could be really fishery specific, depending on the fishery and the depth and the location. Um, and then like the other one that, you know, people often say is like, well, what about night setting? Because that's worked really well in some other regions. But unfortunately in the Arctic, uh, as like many of you know, there is no night during some of this fishing season. And so we have to think about what are the mitigations that are appropriate for gillnet and what are the mitigation appropriate for the arctic and so it's a really interesting problem all right so i think we have uh one time for one more question so diana i'm gonna ask yours um she said great talk jennifer i'm curious if the color morphology of full mars in the canadian arctic colonies support the idea that there is migration or gene flow between the colonies yeah, the answer is no. Uh, Lily did look at the color morphs. And so, again, if you know about fulmars, we, you know that there are certain areas of the world that have kind of more gray morphs or dark morphs and certain areas that have light morphs. And the work that she did suggests that, like, clearly there's a, a genetic link to color, but the genetic, the overall genetic structure was very loose. And so there, in Canada, we, we don't have um, we kind of have a very loose structure. There's not, there's one kind of what we're calling management unit. And so the straight, the easy and yet complex answer is, is no, we don't see any, um, kind of, uh, direct or, or very straightforward link between color morph and gene flow or genetic structure. 
Um, thank you to the Arctic. Sorry, I'm just going to insert this real quick. I know a lot of the Arctic IRP folks um, have to head out because they have um, their meeting starting, but I just wanted to thank everybody um, uh, that is piecing out because of that. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, let's see, we can do the one, one last question that's here from um, Elizabeth, and she asks, what are the primary bird bycatch species in the char gillnet fishery? Yeah, great question. Loons is the easiest answer. Um, and, you know, if for those of you who are familiar with the species, you know, that could be several species. <laughs> so as again, right, it's an ID problem. We think that the species here pictured here, this is again by Bonnie, these are, we think that these are, I think they're called thick billed loons. Um, so I'm not a, I'm not a very good loon person, but one of the challenges are when we look at the, again, the at sea, sorry, well, it's not at sea, but the observer data from the gillnet fishery is it's, it's all loons, but that could be three species. So we thought it was going to be red-throated loons, and we kind of were going in that direction, and then we started getting these photos of these thick-billed loons, um, which kind of, or sorry, they're not thick-billed, but um, they're broad buildings, but they're they're like another species. So we're we're actually have a study where we're going to do a survey, and again, this goes back to like in Nooktuk and getting the words right and making sure you're using the right terminology. Is it's going to be a fisher survey, a pictorial fishing survey to collect the names of the three species in Nooktuk and confirm what they're what they're reporting um, in future data to try to get it. So loons are 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 the you know the group. But unfortunately, that gives us three different species in this in this region, and, and certainly what we think of as the most common loon species is not what our pictures are of. So, um, you know, to be determined. It's not always the case with science. Still looking into it. We'll find yeah, out. Yeah, right. More <laughs> questions always. <laughs> More to do. <laughs> um let's see yeah i don't see any other questions in the chat ash i definitely think you should reach out to jennifer directly um and talk with her absolutely um and jen maybe you want to just drop your email in the um chat box just in case uh they ash doesn't have that from the seminar series um yeah and thanks for everybody for joining us we thank you so so much jennifer, for your talk today um as a reminder next week we will be meeting on Monday for seminar and uh, it will be with Julia Gross who's a PhD biological oceanographer at Geomar in Kiel Germany and she will be sharing about her winter um, uh, on the RV polar stern so that'll be I think another really fun one and then of course if you miss any of our seminars or want to re-listen to any you can find them on NOAA PMEL's uh, YouTube page and there's actually a specific link now um, just for our seminars, which is really great. So again, Jennifer, thank you so much uh, for doing this. And um, I hope we can stay in touch. And um, everybody, thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.